Hello, Monetization Nation. Eric Farr is the CEO of Brainstorm, a software company with a platform that helps large organizations manage employee change. In the early days of Eric Farr's company, Brainstorm, a client came to them about a problem. The client needed the order for a training meeting the next Monday in Scotland, and Eric's company promised they would have their order in the European office in time for the training. Later, the Brainstorm team discovered that there was no way to ship the order through a commercial shipping company and have the order arrive in time. In this episode, Eric will share his story of how he handled this tricky situation, how the client became one of the top clients of Brainstorm for years, how it became part of company lore, and helped set the culture within the company. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan Gwilliam, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. Hi, Eric. Hey, how are you? Good. It's been, it's been forever, Nathan. Yes, it has been. Just a little bit of an introduction for you. So yeah. I looked through your LinkedIn page. Um, you're the, the founder, CEO, owner, uh, and everything else of Brainstorm Inc. Everything, everything except founder. Uh, actually, we we acquired okay. Brainstorm. Okay. Yeah, we acquired Brainstorm. It it, it was uh, it was a, a group quickly. It was founded in '95. Grew quickly, you know, through dot com bust, 9/11, Y2K, and that put the company really on on, but for the most part, insolvent. And John and I were working, we just graduated from business school a couple of years before that. We were working on doing a startup. What's that? Wharton, by the way, not just a business school, but one of the oh, two best business schools in, in the world. You're kind. It, it, it was a great place. We had, uh, we had, uh, we were lucky to, I was lucky to get invited to attend. Um, okay. So the first question I have for you is I, uh, I was interviewing your father or talking to your father. And he shared a great story of credibility. Um, so I started off writing this book and it was gonna be about credibility marketing. And it's kind of evolved as I've been doing these interviews and working with my editor. And, and the, the book is, is going to be now about monetization. And credibility marketing is one of the key components, um, one of the biggest elements of this book, but it's a little bit bigger than that. Anyways, as, as I was talking to your dad about credibility, he told me a story about you and a commitment that your company had made and you um, taking some extreme steps to make sure that commitment was, was met and how that became kind of corporate lore within your company. I was just wondering if you would tell us that story. Sure. So um, we early on, we didn't have much money and we, we, um, we used to sell some printed, printed materials and well, quick start cards. We still sell them, but quick start cards, uh, little cheat sheets for software. Um, and we had a client call from Scotland and, uh, order some thousands of them probably. And, uh, for a training meeting that they or training that they had. So we shipped them off and, and, uh, that was that. But on a Thursday, I think it was a Thursday, they, the client called and said, Hey, you, um, these cards are not going to get here until Monday afternoon and we need them for the training on Monday. And pretty much, you know, this was, this was the first time they'd ordered from us. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was a, it was a pretty good sale for us at, at the time. Again, we had, we had no money. We we're, you know, bootstrapping a turnaround. And so, um, so I said, no worries, you know, we're going to take, we're going to take care of it. And, you know, one of the things that we, we've tried to uh, kind of put into our culture is, you know, it's not, that is not the moment of blame either way. It, it really is more of a moment of let's just solve the problem to this day. I, build a relationship because you're there for them in their difficult time. That, that's right. <clears throat> that's right. And how, and, and, you know, if they told us they needed to be there Monday, we, we in theory got them there on Monday. If they told them that they had a training on Monday and we need them for that, then maybe we screwed up. I actually don't know. I, I never 
I have no idea what happened other than we we were not going to meet their expectations and uh, we look at as we look at clients as, as life long clients you know we definitely are, are thinking more about the lifetime value of the client we're definitely looking at whatever you pay us needs to be less than the value you receive you know I, I it's, it's a little bit like as long as value is greater than cost that equals a sale and so uh, so so we want to we want to always make sure we're delivering more value than the people that our customers are paying for and so all those all those thoughts come in very quickly and we're like fine we'll, we'll take care of it well turns out you cannot overnight I thought you could overnight or anything in the world to, <laughs> you know, I just thought that overnighting was the thing that you could do. <laughs> and uh, we couldn't get it overnight uh, to, to them. There's no way to do it. It wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, there's no cost that would allow us to do it. So, uh, so after spending, you know, a fair amount of the morning trying to figure out how to overnight this stuff, we just, that was not going to be the solution. So, we just said, you know what? Let's just take them. We'll just, we'll, if, if, if someone else can't overnight them, we will, and we'll get on a plane and we'll do it. And, uh, so John and I had a little bit of a debate. Uh, somehow I ended up picking the short straw. <laughs> Not really. It's probably because I had been, I was more on the sales side. And, and, uh, and so we bought a ticket because we had no money. It was, it was, I think I went from Salt Lake to LA to New York, to London, to Edinburgh. Oh my goodness. I think, I think that that's how, I think, and I think there was supposed to be a Las Vegas in the middle of that, but I, I think we worked around the Las Vegas piece. So, cause we're buying a ticket, you know, we're buying a ticket on a Thursday, on a Friday morning, I think is when we bought the ticket to leave Saturday morning. So, um, so it was not cheap. It was not cheap you know, again, no money. So it was a bummer. It was a huge bummer to, to have to do this. But at the same time, it was like, we got to do it. This is, I mean, this is what this company is going to be built on. That's right. And so it became corporate culture. It became corporate lore. Tell me a little bit more about that. How has that helped your company over the years since then? Well, you know, corporate lore is, is really good. There, there's a couple, we have, we have more instances like that, that, that have been, remember, remember the Scotland thing? And now we can say, remember the Wyoming, you know, remember being the last people on the, on the freeway before they shut the freeway down because of the storms, as we try to get to Wyoming to serve our clients there. Um, you know, we, 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 we have built stories on that and, and it really becomes, it's one thing, um, it's one thing to be, uh, to hear the lore. It's another thing to have a rally cry and see the company come together and create more lore. Yes. Right. So, so yours is the foundational lore, and then uh, yeah, but but we don't talk about Scotland as much as we now talk about some of these other things that other employees have done. Not 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 you know me uh, and John as as kind of the, the the founders or you know whatever, but uh, more of employees coming out and saying, look, no, we got to do this. This is who we are. You know, culture is. Culture, I'm going to get into a little bit of a culture discussion, but culture, so many people traditionally have thought of culture as perks. Like, oh, this is a great culture. I mean, we get, you know, we get, they bring in lunch every day and we get, you know, we have arcade games and all this stuff. No, culture is the, the blood of a company. What, what defines, what are we going to do when times are hard? And what are we going to do when, when we have a client that feels this way? What are we going to do? Um, uh, you know, how are we going to come together as a team when there's challenges or whatever? You know, I think that's true, true culture. Yeah. Perks and some of that stuff is part of it, uh, maybe an aspect of it, but true culture is this, when we have a client that's struggling, what are we going to do? We're going to blame the client. It makes it hard. I'll tell you, it makes it, we're not a very good client because we have pretty high, ex we, we live a life that is, you know, we have high expectations. I am shocked at how many times I'm like, we would have done that so differently. And, and, uh, you know, to our vendors, the way they treat us and, and it's, you know, most vendors I, I think are missing a real opportunity. So the outcome of, 
Scotland though. Um, so I went, I met her on a, on a Sunday evening. By the time I got there a Sunday evening, she was amazed. She could not believe it. We, I was in Scotland for two hours. <laughs> and uh, so she picked me up. We went and grabbed a drink. Uh, I gave her the boxes. And by the way, it was like probably 200 pounds of crap I was carrying with me. <laughs> and, uh, and I was in Scotland for, for two hours. And, and uh, Good thing uh, the luggage wasn't lost. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine? And so, but they became one of our top five customers for many years after that. That's the punchline right there. That's the payoff. And yeah. uh, here's the thing, though, Nathan. I, this is this runs so deep in our in our culture that we have, you know, I've I've authorized spending tens of thousands of dollars to solve the value question, the value balance, mm-hmm. knowing a hundred percent that that customer is not going to come back. So So you do that who you are and not because you're going to get the payoff. The payoff, the payoff was great, but we would have done it anyway. And I have, we have done it anyway and we continue to do it anyway because it's the right way to do it. I love it. We get, we, we promise something. It's the culture by that promise. Yep. And, and it's important for the customer, it's important for the customers to know that, but it's all, it's equally as important for our employees to know that. Um, and then we just want to feel right about what we're doing. All right. Uh, let's talk monetization really quick. Yeah. You do some interesting things because you're a SaaS company. And one of the, the core sections of this book is called continuity. So it's the recurring revenue streams. Yeah. As a SaaS company, you have those recurring revenue streams. Can you tell me a little bit, um, any secrets or strategies or stories of running a continuity revenue stream business? Well, I, uh, I think, I think there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, some of the same concepts and that is, you know, you're, you're thinking about a lifetime value of a customer. And, uh, uh, if you're thinking anything different, you're, you're missing the boat on these, on these recurring revenue streams. One of the things that, um, that that requires is everybody in the whole company thinking about the lifetime value of the customer and, uh, and that relationship and the value that we need to provide, not just at the sale point, but through the whole relationship. And so we're constantly thinking about just because they're on some subscription doesn't mean that we talk to them when we sell it and then we talk to them a month out when they're going to renew it. We owe them value. And the value that we owe them um, is, you know, when they buy something, we owe them value through the whole year. When they buy something the second, when they renew, they, they are owed value through that year. And, um, and so we, we think a lot about that and how, how we can add value and make sure again, that the value equation for us is on the, on the right side, but getting everybody aligned is important because there, you know, we saw uh, early on that a seller, a seller can sell a deal, but not sell a renewal. And, and that's an important distinction. If a seller is motivated, you know, to, to get the initial sale, then they can get the initial sale, but they may not be set up to renew. And so we talk in at brainstorm about how we don't, we don't think we, we, we don't consider a customer until they've renewed. If we, if we get a renewal, that's a customer. If they don't renew, that was a transaction. Is the renewal month two or is the renewal year two? Annual. We, we, for the most part, we're doing in annual contracts. Yeah. But, but that's been a little bit of a rally cry too. Like, like, Hey, you didn't, you want to sell, we want customers. We don't want transactions and seller. You need to be selling customers, not transactions. I love that. And it's a, it's a very different, I mean, the, the setting up for the renewal happens in the sales process. No question. Yes setting the expectations, consistently providing value. I'm a big believer in the concept of month to month contracts. And I know a lot of people don't agree with me on that. 
um, the longest client I've ever had um, was with me for 11 years. Uh, it was an advertiser at adoption.com and they advertised with me every single month for 11 years. And I had them in a, um, in an, a month to month contract. And I saw that month to month contract as the secret of the longevity because and if they weren't happy, I had to change the contract. I had to redesign new ad banners. I had to change placements. I had to, you know, keep maintaining the relationship where if, if I had forced them to stay in an annual contract, I may have, I may have gotten complacent and not yeah. had to, had to do what it took. And then as soon as they would have got to the end of that annual contract, they would have canceled. Right. And keeping month to month, it forces me to keep them happy every month. I love that. I think, I think that's a really uh, insightful comment internally, introspectively about the value of month to month. We, you know, we, we run into uh, large enterprise type challenges uh, associated with trying to do something month to month. It, it creates a, a fair amount of uh, yes. transaction costs. Um, yeah. But, but we are, we do, we do some month to month. Um, in in a SMB space, but we do it through partners and, and other things. So it's a, it's a little bit it's a little bit. Most of our stuff is annual. I love what you said, though. That's something I got to think about. That's good. Those are good thoughts. Um, any other secrets to growing a continuity revenue stream in a SaaS business? Oh man, if you're not doing it, do it. It's <laughs> like it's the right place. It's the right place to be. Why Why do you feel that way? Well, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, we, we lived in a, we lived in a world that was, um, uh, originally where, you know, training was perceived to be important as new software came, was released, which in most cases is on a, you know, three year time cycle. So, so for us, it was, there was, a, there was just so much lumpiness in, in the business, whereas a recurring revenue, uh, business just from a, just from the actual uh, business perspective, you know, under, uh, knowing the planning is easier, you know, budgeting is easier. Uh, the value of the firm is higher, yeah, but uh, by, by leaps and bounds. Uh, that may be a bubble, but you know, nonetheless, because of the predictability of the revenue, you you get a lot of different benefits. And, uh, and the ability, I think, to, uh, to just run a better business than having some amount of lumpiness. One of the, the big secrets that we're going to talk about in this book is connection. Um, sometimes people call it humanizing. Sometimes people call it creating a movement. Um, but we believe that one of the tectonic shifts happening in business today is businesses creating connections with their customers. Can you think of any great examples within your business or other businesses you've observed where they've done a great job of creating that connection? Um, we had a, you know, our, we're bootstrapped for the most part. Um, we created software based on a deal that we did with a fortune 10 company at the time. And uh, they, they, presented, they told us what they wanted. And we said, you know, that's what we've been thinking about creating. And they, we showed them some PowerPoint slides and they bought our, really our, our, our SaaS business came from this transaction, this relationship with this company. And they said, they said, brainstorm, we'll, we'll buy it. Now, and this is like January or February, we'll buy it now, you deliver it in December. That's so cool. And, uh, and the, the, cool, the cool connection, the, the, I mean, we were truly partners, right? They, their benefit is we're gonna get the product that we wanted to get, one. Two, we have input on what this is gonna be like. Yes, so For exactly us, what they need. Yeah, exactly. And, and we then have a product that we can then monetize and resell beyond, beyond them. And, uh, it was a, there was an enormous amount of trust 
uh, for them to do that looking back. There, there was, uh, so here's what happened. I'll, I'll tell you the end, and, and this created a new rally cry, one that we still talk about. Uh, they gave us till the end of the year. In about the first week of December, they called and they said, we actually need it by the 9th or something like that. So consider December 1st, they call and they need it by the 9th. And the reason they need it by the 9th is because they're hard coding. This is before, this is before true SAS. Uh, they're hard coding it on the, every computer. And this is a, this is hundreds of millions of dollars that they're spending on a total refresh of, of both hardware and software. And, uh, and they're going to hard code this software into each computer and they need to build December 9th so that they can prep the computers and all the technology by the end of the year. We get it. We're cutting like two and a half, three weeks after development. If you can make it happen, great. Same thing. Got the team in the room. This is it. What are we going to do? No, we're going to freaking do it. That's what we're going to do. And, uh, it was like December 2nd, I think in about 48 hours, we had hired 40 people, cousins of cousins, and I mean, just whoever. And we ran 24 hours a day, brought in three meals a day. John, I know John and I went into the office on a Monday. I don't think we got back until a Thursday, just long enough to take a shower and go back to the office. We were, we were absolutely cranky. And we got it done and we were able to deliver that sucker to the client. They were, they had no idea. They still have no idea what we did to get that done, but they were, they were so happy to have it. And, and we have had people say, I want people in the company. This is the most amazing thing who did not experience that moment. They say, I want, I want a moment like that. We need, uh, a moment like that. We have a name for it. It's a client name. We, we need this type of, you know, it'd be like, we need a Walmart moment. It wasn't Walmart. We need a Walmart moment. And, uh, and because they want to feel that connection, not, not just with the client or for the client or on behalf of the client, but the team itself came together in a way that was unbelievable. Yeah. So that, that'd be one example. Really, really. I, I mean, we were so grateful for them. It really was the beginning of our SaaS product. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Last question I got for you. Yeah. One of the secrets we're going to talk about in this book a lot is information products. There's a lot of businesses that they sell a widget, but they also have a lot of knowledge in the space. And there's a lot of opportunity for them to sell a series of information products from books and eBooks to uh, online education, to virtual summits, to um, you know, challenge courses to coaching, you know, there's a whole series of products where you can not sell a commodity where you're selling the same thing everybody else is selling, but you can differentiate yourself by adding a series of information products to your offering. And you can add a value ladder where you're not just selling one thing, you've got a series of products. Um, you sell training, you sell, um, you, you have a, a variety of, of information products. And and probably software is even in, maybe even an information product. I guess you might make a case for that. Um, tell me a little about, do you have any thoughts about secrets or stories about a wisdom you want to share about information products? We, we actually would say that we sell, um, we sell change. Like that's really what we're selling. Okay. We, we sell change in behavior, you know, changing behavior to reach a business objective. So we, we want to talk to, you know, our discussion might look like this. Hey, you're spending $100 million on X software platform. Why? And there's so, many, there's so many people who are like, I don't know. I don't know why, because that's what we do. And then we say, well, let's figure out why. And what that does for us is elevates the conversation, always has to elevate it to, until you get to someone who's like, no, this is what we're trying to do. Uh, we had an airline that's like, no, we, we're trying to, we need to reduce costs by $20 million. That is our business objective. And then we can say, great, let's map to that. We're going to help you do that. 
we had another customer, a uh, pharmaceutical customer, that said our objective is to uh, get product to market faster. And we're like, okay, great. How do we utilize the technology that you have to do that? And we're going to map to those things. So because we sell that way, what really becomes important is data and, and the information. So, so we are, we are, I mean, we have billions of records of how people are utilizing uh, software. And what we're able to do with that is, is, you know, through machine learning and, and uh, you know, the algorithms that we have, we're able to take that data and come back to the organization and say, look, here's, here's a lever we pulled and, and this is the result. Here's a, here's, um, here's a tool that you're using. You've chosen to use this tool for video conferencing. Do you know that your organization actually uses 12 tools for video conferencing? Probably more, more, more staggering is you've chosen this tool for data storage, like document storage in the cloud. Do you know that there's 50, your employees are using 15 different ones, including their own personal Dropbox? Like that kind of, that kind of data is like to, to our customers because they can't see it. They can't see it. So uh, for us, information is a really, really important component of what we're, what we're trying to sell. Um, to arm our clients, we're selling them the information. We're sell, we're, we don't sell it. It's, it's part, of, part of what we do, but we provide them the information to make really good business decisions about their technology and how they're utilizing it to make sure that they're reaching their objectives. And I love how you're going in and finding out what their highest priority is, what is most important to them, and then you're selling them the solution to that. That's right. That is selling them software. That's brilliant. As, as it pertains to the technology that they use, how can we, we want to sell you, you've got the technology. We now want to sell you how to use it to drive to your object, business objective. And from a renewal perspective, once we're, once we're making progress on that, that's the value. Now let's choose another business objective and let's create value around that. Usually the business objectives, of course, they, they fall within, you know, increasing revenue, decreasing costs or uh, uh, dealing with security. Like those are, those are like three real key things. Um, and so, you know, the Dropbox thing, you know, having documents, corporate documents stored in, you know, 20 different clouds, bad, it's bad. Yeah. And, and so that type of information allows us to be able to say, not, not only is it bad from a security standpoint, but somewhere within the organization, they're paying for all those. Plus the loss of information capital. Someone leaves and you're never yeah. able to find that data again. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, so information is what helps us really, uh, the data is what really helps us communicate to the clients what we can do for them and if we're winning or not winning. And we want them to see that and we want to see it too. If you enjoyed this interview and want to learn more about Eric or connect with him, you can find him on LinkedIn and there's a link to his LinkedIn profile on the blog. Or you can visit the company's website at brainstorminc.com. Thank you so much, Eric, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from this episode to help us provide greater value to our clients. Number one, make the value of our products and services much greater than the cost. Number two, go the extra mile to exceed customer expectations and make them happy, as Eric did by personally delivering the order to Scotland. Number three, if you haven't already, consider implementing recurring revenue streams into your business. Number four, take care of our customers throughout the time between renewals and our recurring revenue streams. Number five, consider using month-to-month -month contracts so we're motivated to provide value and keep our customers happy every month. We may be able to keep our clients with us even longer. Number six, create a culture that when a client needs something that seems impossible, our team can come together and make it happen. Number seven, focus on helping our customers reach their most important goals. Did you like today's episode? 
then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, get a free monetization assessment of your business or subscribe to the free Monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com. Number two, please subscribe to the Monetization Nation podcast and YouTube channel. And number three, please follow Monetization Nation on Instagram and Twitter. What are some of the best ways you have seen companies provide value to their customers? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining us for this episode. I hope you have a fabulous day. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.